Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview with Edward Dressler, Days in Hicksville, New York, the 15th of July, 2003, uh, approximately 10.30 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Yes, Edward Dressler, uh, 521-25, uh, Bronx, New York. Okay, what was your educational background prior to entering military service? High school uh, academic graduate. Okay, um, do you know where you were and what your reaction was when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, it was one of, uh, just like 9-11, of course, it was exactly the same thing. It was a, you know, it's, it's, they live in infamy, just like Roosevelt said. and. Uh, it caused a lot of us to, uh, I guess, become more patriotic. It's just uh, something you didn't believe. But uh, as I say, it's just like 9/11. It's, it's, it's a lot of analogies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, were you drafted or did you enlist? Uh, I was got out of high school and I was supposed to go into the army, drafted, but I uh, went down and enlisted in the navy. Because I always liked the, the uh, naval part of everything, and uh, I enlisted in the Navy instead of being waited to be drafted. Okay. Uh, where did you go for your training? Samson Naval Training mm -hmm. up in uh, Lake Geneva, mm -hmm. New York. Mm -hmm. um, how long were you there, and can you tell us about some of your, your training? Well, one thing that stands out uh, for Lake Geneva was cold as hell up there, right off the lake. And, uh, and one thing I learned was never volunteer in the service. And... Uh, the chief uh, said, who can play the drums? And in my church uh, band, I happened to be the drummer. And naturally, you're 17, 18 years old, and you raise your hand, and oh, I can play the drums. And uh, I wound up with blisters on my fingers, my thighs were black and blue, they rumped the drum all day long with drilling, 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 and marching, and I never learned to volunteer after that. <laughs> that was one thing that stood out beside the cold weather. Mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, I wanted to be a gunner's mate. I wanted to fight the war myself. And uh, because I was a uh, academic high school graduate, they, uh, they took me into the medical corps, and I went to uh, Philadelphia uh, Medical Training Center and uh, spent quite a few weeks there in training. And then uh, we shipped over to England and to a. You know, now, did you have a specialty? Training that you did at in Philadelphia. Well, it was uh, for a hospital uh, pharmacist mate, mm -hmm. pharmacist mate, and uh, uh, in, in in other words, in some of the ships, just later on, you become the ship's doctor, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. on a landing ship, which mm -hmm. I later on became. So you were a corpsman too, then. A corpsman, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what uh, the training was for. Okay. You know, you have uh, gunners' mates and, uh, and and machinists and so on and. The last thing I wanted was to be in a medical corps, but it wound up great. And I learned things that uh, helped me throughout life, mm -hmm. and minor surgery and, and uh, materia medica and uh, uh, things like that that uh, helped me to, uh, you know, in, in different injuries on a ball field, which uh, I, I'll tell you about later on. Okay, um, when you went over to England, uh, how did you go over? I went over on the, uh, on the Queen Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, 10,000 troops aboard with no escort. and uh, So you were a single ship then? Yes, and mm -hmm. we're lucky that we got over there because it would have been some catastrophe for that to have been sunk. But we slept in, uh, in tiers of about five or six, uh, six bunks, and I think everybody, there was 9,999 people seasick on the way over. When you reached England, where were you assigned? Uh, I went to a naval dispensary in Falmouth, Cornwall, England, uh, before the invasion, and uh, was there for quite a while before the invasion, and then uh, assigned to a landing ship, LST number 137, for the invasion. So you went in, uh, you went over for the invasion itself? Yes. Um, what do you recall about the invasion? The Number of ships, the planes going overhead. Well, the, I never saw so many ships in all my life. We we uh, we took the British Eighth Army to Gold Beach uh, 
it wasn't as bad as uh, Omaha and so on, but uh, and there was quite a few uh, boys lost. And uh, as they were going over the side and into the water, up to their necks in water, half of them were so seasick to begin with that they would, uh, they would, didn't care. They lived or died when they went in the water because uh -huh. it was so rough. And when all these ships opened up their uh, their barrages, it, it was it talked about the Fourth of July, and. Uh, I, I sustained a, uh, a hearing loss due to all the battleship gunfires and everything, 10% uh, disability through that, uh, which I've uh, sustained throughout my uh, life, and uh, it's uh, it's been something I had to put up with and, and overcome. Mm -hmm. But uh, to see all these ships, thousands and thousands of, of, uh, of boys and hundreds of ships, battleships, and cruisers and destroyers and landing ships and so on all firing at the same time it was just like 4th of July multiplied a hundred times. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, go in on the, on the beach at all? No, we did not go in. We uh, were a landing ship. We mm -hmm. we uh, opened up the bow doors and the, the tanks and, and we had some LCIs on our tank deck too, which were put down and they had the troops uh, on and then they went ashore. Uh -huh. uh, we took most of the wounded back to uh, to uh, England. Took many Nazi troops uh, and uh, prisoners of war uh, aboard and took them back. Uh, we did different runs back and forth, taking uh, prisoners of war back and uh, and wounded and so on. Uh -huh. And uh, did you do any treatment of yes, the wounded uh, while I've, you were? I've uh, you did things you would not believe that, uh, such as suturing and and uh, uh, medications and. Uh, tourniquets and, and uh, stopping the flow of blood and uh, different things that a doctor would do in that emergency. But uh, there wasn't enough doctors to go around and you just did things that uh, uh, you were taught to do, that you never thought you could do. I never liked the sight of blood, but after a while it just became second nature. And I remember one soldier was crying because he lost his leg. And uh, I said, John, look next to you. And the soldier next to him had no legs. And so it was Somebody's worse off than you, but that doesn't help you with the, mm -hmm. the one leg off. And you held, you held a hand, gave them cigarettes, and tried to give them as much morphine as you could, and uh, helped them as much as possible. But uh, it was something you never forget. You never, you never forget the smell of a dirty wound. That, that stays with you the rest of your life. And uh, when I was over there, the, the one thing that I remembered was uh, my mother was the greatest in the world to me. and. Uh, uh, she used to send me pictures of the war all the time, and she sent me this one picture not knowing I was in it. It was in the invasion. I sent the picture back and said, Ma, this is me. So she sent the picture to the, to the Daily News, New York Daily News, and they sent her a gloss picture back. But how many mothers would send their son a picture of the war not knowing their son is in it? <laughs> you know, it was quite an uh, oddity. And uh, while I was over there, on leave one time in England, in Falmouth, I used to go down to Cornwall, I met this English girl. In those days in high school, you're lucky held the cheerleader's hand. You know, you, you were a ball player, and it wasn't like today, and uh, I got over there and met this English girl. She was 15, I was 17, and uh, I sent a note home to my mother, Mom, I'm getting married. <laughs> she sends a note back, you marry her, you stay there, you're coming home, you're going to college, and so on. That was, that was the end of that romance. <laughs> You know, you, you listen to your mother in those days, but it was, uh, she was great. How long were you in, involved in taking prisoners and wounded back and forth from Normandy? Uh, until uh, the, the resistance was over, until we, we uh, established the beachhead, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, there was no need for it then. And then we did different uh, duty in the North Sea, and up in Oslo and Norway and so on. Can I go back a second to D-Day? Did you uh, treat any of the German POWs? They were not, we didn't take any, any uh, wounded, mm -hmm. sure, that I can remember, but mm -hmm. uh, they were just like any other soldier. They were not Nazis. They were, they were German soldiers, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm German myself, and uh, I could have just as well been theirs on the other side, and uh, you felt sorry for them in a way, because some of them were glad to be captured. They were going to get a, uh, a hot meal and, uh, and be treated uh, fairly. As a matter of fact, uh, the Germans went by the Geneva Treaty, mm -hmm. which the Japanese did not. And as soon as the war was over in, uh, in uh, uh, 
the European theater, I was supposed to go to the Japanese theater and wear a Marine uniform but uh, with a Navy rate and wear a sidearm, a gun. Because the Japanese did not go by the Geneva Treaty. And uh, they would uh, shoot a corpsman because then you could not take care of any other wounded. I say the Germans did go by the Geneva Treaty. But when they dropped the A-bomb, it, it saved us from going over there and saved hundreds of thousands of American boys' lives. I mean, a lot of people were against the A-bomb, but they didn't realize that it did save many, many uh, American boys' lives. Okay, so after uh, the resistance ended at D-Day, you were into the North Sea area? Yeah, we, so went, uh, we did shuttle duty <coughs> up in North Sea and then uh, uh, back and forth. And uh, uh, I remember being out there one time, and in those days, radar was not like it is today. And uh, we detected a uh, Nazi sub out there, and we had to shut off all the engines, and everybody could not even talk. And uh, we had to... Uh, uh, wait and see if they detected us and everybody's sitting there and any second you could have been blown sky high. It's quite, a, quite an experience to sit there and have your life blown up any second. You know, it's just, what kind of ship were you on? Were you still on a landing, a landing ship, yes. LST, okay. And they had a crew of over three, four hundred. Mm -hmm. So it was not the, uh, you know, and, and matter of fact, today uh, I was the uh, president of the New York State uh, landing, uh, LST Association which uh, encompasses all of uh, the counties in New York. And to try to, to run an association like that, when everybody is near 80, you can't plan five years down the road. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a tough, uh, tough thing to do. Somebody can't drive, somebody can't see, somebody can't hear. Uh, but it's, uh, we, we, did, we did exist, and we have one of the largest organizations on Long Island now. Uh, the uh, Long Island uh, Amphibious Forces Association, over 180 to 200 people. Mm. And we, we have dinners and we have picnics and so on. And uh, uh, they, uh, every time we meet, uh, they fight the war all over again. So what were uh, some of your duties until the end of the war? Where well, after the, you... after the war, I was uh, back in England and uh, then I was sent back to the Philadelphia Naval Hospital for a while, and uh, then I was discharged, mm -hmm. and uh, then, uh, then I started private life again. Did you uh, use the GI Bill at all? Yes, I did. I uh, I went to uh, NYU, New York University, for one year. I was a a, a catcher in baseball, and uh, I went to NYU for one year. I lived in St. Albans in Queens, and NYU was in uh, uh, Washington Square in, in uh, New York. And I'd go to school there and then go to Washington Heights for baseball practice and get home at 9 o'clock at night and then you have to study. So then the next year I transferred to Hofstra University in Hempstead and uh, spent three years there and uh, played against NYU in the same conference. And then I graduated uh, from, from Hofstra and, and uh, played the semi-pro ball and started a, uh, an umpire's organization in, uh, in softball, and which today is one of the... Uh, largest in the country and I subsequently became involved and uh, I'm now in the National Softball Hall of Fame in Oklahoma City uh, as an umpire, one of the only eight in the whole country. Oh, and, uh, it, Congratulations. It, uh, it's, it's quite a feat. Yes. Uh, did you ever use the 5220 club? Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, for, for three, four years. Uh, uh, every summer you sign, you get your check and, and uh, uh, but I was getting paid two, three nights a week and Sundays to play baseball. And at that time, five bucks a game. And five dollars in, in, uh, in the 50s was, was good money with your 20 dollars. Mm -hmm. And living like a king. I had more girlfriends in those days with the money I was making. I had my own car and everything and uh, it, was, it was really great. It was a wonderful thing, the GI Bill. Um, now, did you join? <clears throat> <laughs> Any other veterans organizations be, besides the amphibious force group? I was in VFW for a while, yes, in the American Legion, uh, but it got to be too much. And uh, I became a Mason during the Masonic Order. And uh, after graduating from Hofstra, I did go back. I became a recreation director for the Nassau County Department of Recreation and Parks. And I went back to Hofstra as a adjunct professor for quite a few years 
and uh, enjoyed that because it became a university then. When I graduated, it was a college. When I went back, it, was a, it became a university and enjoyed going back as a professor. And as a matter of fact, uh, I married uh, one of the girls that was my umpires. Yeah. She was 20 years younger, and uh, we used to umpire together. And uh, one oddity, we worked the game together, and uh, being younger, she, she was working the bases one game, and we were working a tournament from team out of town, and this guy's running off the field, he says to my wife, hey, baby, what are you doing after the game? So uh, she said, let me ask my husband, he's working a plate. <laughs> so she comes in, I said, what does this guy say to you? So she told me, I said, I'm going to have some fun with this guy. He gets up to the plate, I said, you know, you never try to pick up the plate on by his wife, so in three pitches, not even close, everyone was a strike. And uh, he turns around and said, don't say a word. <laughs> and, and the whole bench knew what happened, they were laughing from like hell. <laughs> but that was, that was an oddity. Did you uh, go to any reunions? Yes, of course, in Oklahoma City and uh, yeah. for, for softball with the Hall of Fame and uh, uh, and actually with the landing ships, uh, we're going to state and state uh, reunion as a past president and so on. And uh, it's, it's, been, it's been great. I've, uh, the, the service was good to me and so was uh, you know, the GI Bill and so on. Really wonderful. The, the one thing that I, I thought of when I was in the service was not myself when I was wounded or got wounded, it was my mother, what, uh, what she would think when she got the telegram. Of course, in those days, I had the gold star in the window if you uh -huh. got killed or so on. And she was, she was, uh, she was the only thing I thought about with my mom. Uh -huh. Were you ever wounded or no? I would, but I did get a ten percent disability for, the, for yeah. the hearing. Uh, <coughs> um, did you recall if you had a reaction when President Roosevelt died? Uh, well, he was he was one of our uh, greatest presidents, as we all know, and. Uh, uh, we were in the morning, just like when John Kennedy was killed. You know, he, he died in office and, and so on. And uh, he was the one that helped the country out of all the, the economic problems. And uh, you know, and uh, his, his speech about living in infamy uh, uh, was one of the greatest I can remember. Uh, he was he was one of my greatest heroes. Yes, uh -huh. I, I, it was really uh, it was very emotional. Uh -huh. I know you've answered this somewhat, but uh, how do you think your time in the service affected your life? Well, I, I think I would have uh, would have rather gone right to college from high school, but in those days there was nothing, you just took it for granted that when you graduated this is what you did. And uh, some of the ball players I played with in basketball and baseball in high school never came back. And we never knew when we graduated that uh, we'd say goodbye to somebody, but we'd, we'd never see them again. As a matter of fact, we have, we have reunions, the maid made in Jericho for my high school baseball team from 1943, believe it or not. And last time we met was about a month ago, and there was 15 of us that, that, that played ball in uh, Andrew Jackson High School in Queens in 1943. Uh, talk about the last base hit they got, and I remember the last basket I made in Madison Square Garden, and so on. And it's just like uh, with veterans, you know, how they won the war by themselves. But it's great to have all these people still living and still remembering the the base hit they got and the error they made in 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 '43. Uh, it's uh, it's been a good life. And, uh, Baseball and softball have been good to me. I've seen more states in the Union than, than uh, any, anybody I can imagine. I've been to Hawaii and Mexico and Canada and Alaska and all through softball, Minnesota and Texas and you name it, and all expenses paid. And it's, uh, it's just been a wonderful life, wonderful. Okay, well, thank my, you. My wife is still uh, is a high school teacher, a uh, special education teacher, and... Uh, she is uh, still working. As I said, she's 20 years younger. She, she gonna, we have a place in the Poconos right on the lake. We go up there as often as we can because she's off all summer. And uh, it, it's been great. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs>